and a very warm welcome to this special NQA and ED webinar marking the anniversary of the 2015 standards. My name is Laura Cotton and I'm the Sales and Marketing Director for NQA and I'm joined today by Margaret Rooney and Richard Walsh who are two of our NQA regional assessors here in the UK and they'll be walking us through some of the lessons learned from the first year of the 2015 standards and how we can use these lessons to help us to either transition or to continually improve. There will be a Q&A section at the end of the webinar, so if you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them via the Ask button, which should be at the bottom of your screen, and we will address them at the end of the webinar. For those of you that may want to listen again or have colleagues who couldn't join us today, both the webinar slides and the recording will be available later on today. So, without further ado, I shall pass you over to Margaret and Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I'll be talking about, very briefly, about Annex SL and about the ISO 9001 standard, and then I'll be handing over to my colleague Richard, who will be focusing on the ISO 14001 um, changes. So, as Laura has indicated, ISO 9001 and ISO 14001 are now a year old. Happy birthday. As I'm sure many of you are aware, there is a third standard, the Health and Safety Standard, ISO 45001. It's not now expected until the end of 2017. What makes these standards siblings? Annex SL, the common thread for these three and all future management system standards. And very briefly, because I'm sure you've all seen this many, many times, just to remind ourselves that the structure of Annex SL the 10 clauses As I say, I'm sure you're all very familiar with that structure, which is common to all the, 20, the two 2015 standards and the health and safety standard when it comes along. And the important thing is that these 10 clauses and their numbering uh, cannot be changed. However, for discipline-specific text in 9001 and 14001, and for 45,001, when we finally see it, you can have additional sub-clauses, new bullet points, discipline-specific notes or examples, and additional enhancing text. So what are the big changes that we see in these standards? Context, leadership, risks and opportunities, and the process approach. These are all terms that we haven't seen to any great extent in earlier versions of the standards. Our experience a year in here at NQA, a number of transition audits have taken place and are increasingly taking place. And any stage one and stage two audits for new clients do now tend to generally be against the 2015 standard. So we have some experience both of transitioning and of new systems which are going straight to the 2015 version. Looking now at context, which is one of the more significant uh, changes or introductions that has come with 2015, and this is the definition within the eyes of standards, so it's a combination of internal and external factors and conditions that affect an organization's approach to its product services, investments, and very important, interested parties, which is another concept that has come in with the 2015 standards. In 
April of this year, in our In Touch uh, magazine, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, we did publish some guidance on context and how you could identify your context and your associated interested parties. A number of uh, organizations have used what we call a pestle or SWOT tools to assist them to brainstorm their context and interested parties. So what is it we need to be brainstorming? It's our internal and external issues, <coughs> risks and opportunities associated with those issues, identify the interested parties, and many of these things, they're not totally new to the organization, but you just may not have thought of them in quite this way. So some sort of pestle, swat, or brainstorming could be a very useful way of starting to think more about your context. Then we look at leadership. Again, our experience now with both transition and new clients, auditors now meet with top management and discuss, among other things, strategic issues, high-level risks. Many organizations have a risk register or are beginning to think about a risk register when thinking about the new standard. And they'll talk about the longer-term business plans and expectations. Traditionally, organizations didn't necessarily expect this of their auditors but increasingly, this will be an important element of the audit visit. And very importantly, how is the quality management system going to deliver those or help to deliver those issues? We have the process-based approach. Auditors now discuss your processes and your process effectiveness. How do you know your process is effective? What measures do you need to judge efficiency and effectiveness? What are the potential weak points in your process? Now, a common answer we get, how do you know your process is, is effective? Well, we don't get any complaints. That's fine. Is your process efficient? Are you not getting complaints because everything runs very smoothly internally, or are you generating a lot of internal non-conformances that take time to correct? So that would be a measure of your efficiency. So we're focusing very much more on those issues now. The process approach. Again, lifting some text from the standard here. You'll see at the bottom of this slide the, uh, an illustration of a process flow. And superimposed on that, we indicate where there might be risks within that process. So you will see we have the requirements, the inputs, the operations, the outputs, which all contribute to our products and services. So it's that simple process flow, input, operation, output. But within that, we recognize what risks there might be. This slide illustrates that within 9001-2016, and indeed within earlier versions of the ISO 9001 standard, there were always risk references, but we didn't necessarily use that vocabulary. So you will see on that slide the various areas within the standard. Please don't <coughs> try at this point to read this slide in detail, but you'll have an opportunity to study it later. Um, but there's a significant amount of process, sorry, <coughs> risk-related vocabulary already contained within the standard. So what we need to do is to develop our risk-based thinking. And I'm going to hand over now to my colleague Richard, 
who will be talking about the ISO 14001 changes. Hi, good afternoon. Um, yes, as Margaret has said, we're going to spend a little bit of time just looking at the standards themselves, uh, how we have uh, experienced uh, um, the transition over the last 12 months and look at some of the pitfalls and also lessons learned, uh, look at the pitfalls and how we can maybe uh, avoid them. So as with ISO 9001, uh, 2015, uh, 14,001 2015 was published one year ago. As you would expect, uh, it follows the Annex SL model, and it's expected that it will continue to be used right the way through at least until the end of 2025 and possibly beyond. I think if we look back, the, the existing or the old standard now, the 2004 version, uh, was around for probably 10, 11 years. And I think our understanding of the environment and how it affected businesses had changed quite considerably over those 11 years. And I think it's fair to say that in 2025, if we're still all sat here, that our view of the environment and how it affects us as businesses will have changed completely. And the new standard has been written in a way that it will allow us to, to manage that differing understanding of the environment. <clears throat> Looking at the changes from the old standard to the new standard, I've broken them down into five main changes. Uh, strategic leadership, strategic con context, interested party analysis and communication, risks and opportunities, and life cycle perspective. And we're going to take just a little bit of time to look at each one of those in turn and maybe just explore some of the things that we've picked up as assessors uh, on each of those. So if we look at the first one, which is strategic leadership, the key area, I believe, uh, in the new standard, or one of the key areas, is that senior managers are going to have to both promote and be held accountable for the environmental management system. Now this of course applies equally to 9001 as well. Um, so everything I'm about to say uh, is equally relevant to those of you with just quality uh, standards in place. So this is a key area of senior managers actually having the, um, the responsibility of promoting and being held accountable for the EMS. But one of the questions we got quite a lot of right at the start was how on earth are you going to measure that? Now, obviously, one of the ways is we go and talk to them. We talk to the senior managers, we talk to people who work under them, and we can make a, a judged analysis on, on, on how they're performing in that promotion. However, uh, there are another number of other areas in which we, we, where we can still manage that same <clears throat> uh, commitment. So. One of the requirements is the EMS itself should be integrated with other business processes. We can no longer say that this is what we do as an organisation, oh, and by the way, this is our EMS manual, and we do this thing quite, quite differently. You should be able to take a slice through the organisation at any point and see that thread of EMS, or indeed QMS, run, running through the middle, a bit like a, a, a stick of rock, I guess. So we need to see that the EMS itself is not just separate, uh, carried out by Fred who works down the corridor, but it's actually integrated with all our other business processes, whether they be sales, whether it's marketing, whether it's design, purchasing, they all have a part to play within the EMS. And we need to see that decisions are being made at all levels with consideration for the environment and indeed quality. So therefore, if, if a decision is being made on a new process, if a decision is being made on maybe expansion into a new set of premises, then we would expect to see the environmental team being involved right from the start. So therefore, that the environmental decisions are taken into account right at the start. Now, one of the things I'm still finding as an assessor is that when I speak to uh, environmental managers particularly even under the new standard, they say, well, it would be fine, but actually we're the last to know. <clears throat> I only get told when all the decisions have been made. That is not, to me, demonstrating that the senior management are 
uh, integrating the AMS with other processors and that these decisions are being made at all levels. So that's one of the measures that we would look at into uh, judging how satisfactory senior management buy-in is, if you like. And then finally, environmental policy itself. So this is part of strategic leadership. The policy is the commitment made by the top management on how they are going to manage uh, the environment within within their business. And interestingly, there is a new requirement again. Um, I, I think I've yet to do an audit where this commitment hasn't been in there, and this is the commitment to environmental protection now, not just uh, prevention of pollution. So we need this commitment to protection in there. The problem I'm finding is that a lot of people have put the wording in because the standard says it has to be there, but actually when I ask them what they mean by environmental protection, they haven't a clue. Now, to try and sum it up, I've always seen that prevention of pollution is a little bit reactive. So something happens, what are we going to do about it? Environmental protection is being much more proactive. It's trying to look at what could possibly go wrong, where could we have leaks, where could we emit pollution, and what are we going to do about it, and what, what can we do to mitigate to actually remove that risk altogether. So all of these areas, to me, give some indication as to how the senior managers within an organisation are actually promoting environment. So the next section of the five that we're going to have a look at is strategic context. And as an organisation, you will be expected to be able to demonstrate a broader understanding of the context in which you operate. Now, for a lot of businesses, that has meant going back to square one. Almost going back to who we are, what are we trying to achieve, who's important to us, what do they want from us? What can we logically give them? So we need to be able to see as assessors that you have been through this process and that there is an understanding at all levels, again, particularly at a senior management level, in what the context is in which you as an organisation operate. Now, Again, one of the differences, the old standard was very much geared to how we as organisations impact the environment ourselves. So what do we do? What do we put up our chimneys? What do we put down the drain? What resources do we use? Etc. Etc. The new standard sees the environment as a two-way street. So we need to also be thinking about what's the environment doing to us? Are there any issues being caused to us by climate change? by more extreme weather. Uh, a good example of that, if you're in the UK, within the last couple of days, we've got places within 30, 40 miles of each other with flooding, and yet 40 miles away there would be extreme uh, hot weather. So these sort of issues we need to think about and how these extreme weather patterns can affect us. We also need to be able to ensure now that the EMS is able to meet its intended outcome. And if anybody's listened to any of my previous webinars done through NQA, you will know that I continually bang on about improved environmental performance. That is why we implement an environmental management system in the first place. Uh, and the key to this is all about demonstrating that everything we're doing is about improving our environmental performance. And the EMS, the management system itself, has to be able to meet that outcome. It's not about standing still. It's about continually changing and reflecting the world in which we operate and allowing us to, the EMS to be a vehicle to drive that change forward. That change is going to affect the, the direction of the organisation, of course. Uh, the culture of our organisation, that's something we have to think about. Who are we? Where do we operate? What are our staff like? Who are our staff? What resources have we got? And indeed, what external influences are placed upon us? Um, so really, we are looking at uh, legislation at this point. So we're looking at um, issues that are imposed upon us by legislation. We may also have issues imposed upon us by our customers. I've been working recently with a client who've been told now that they have to use reusable packaging. 
that is an environmental requirement placed upon them by one of their customers and they have to now take that into account and build that in to their environmental management system. So just to sum up this particular slide, uh, really what it, the whole standard has flipped the question about what is your impact on the environment to, to consider the impact of the environment on us as businesses. So moving on again to interested party analysis and communication. So we've already touched a little bit on that in the previous slide on strategic context. So who who are our interested parties or stakeholders? Could almost be anybody who has a legitimate interest in us as a business and how we operate. But we have to be aware of who they are, what they legitimately expect from us and what we need to give to them be it information, uh, advice, whatever it may be, and in what format. So we identify these stakeholder requirements and we need to decide which of these will come, what the standard calls compliance obligations. And I said on the previous slide, a compliance obligation could be a piece of legislation. It could also be uh, an obligation that's come from a non-legislative area, such as a customer requirement. And again, one of the issues that I've found as an assessor over the last 12 months is that a lot of people still think that this particular section is just a new legal register. Now, the standard does allow the term legal register, but it is a lot more than that now. And I've, I believe that if, if a company presents me as an assessor with something that is just a list of pertinent regulations, that tells me straight away that they haven't understood this initial clause of the standard, which is the context of the organisation, and, and that process hasn't been carried out completely. So make sure that you have considered far more than just the legislative issues placed upon you, but you've also looked at other areas where people may have legitimate expectations that you will deliver things in a, in a sustainable way. So once we've worked out what they are and who they are, obviously then we need to then plan the communications and make sure that they're relevant to our compliance obligations. Okay. The next area we're just going to have a look at is risks and opportunities. Um, this is a slight um, building, if you like, on what was originally just aspects and impacts and moving on into uh, environmental objectives. So within ISO 14001, there are three key areas where we can get our risks and opportunities from. Uh, environmental aspects, hopefully we're aware of what aspects are and how we go about assessing what those are. Uh, we also look at compliance obligations, so there are risks associated with compliance obligations. If it's legislation, obviously there is a risk to non-compliance, and if it's a customer uh, requirement, there is obviously a risk of not complying with what our customers are asking to do, and that might be that you lose the business. And then there's a little bit of a safety net, there are other issues and requirements that we may have to take into account that will depend, if I'm honest, on who you are and what sector you're in. It might be as simple as uh, somebody who lives next door and needs to know that they can hang the washing out on a Monday morning without it being covered in sun and dirt. It could be as simple as that. However, we do have to assess all of these sources, be it the aspects, be it compliance obligations and be it the other issues, and we need to assess them for risk and opportunities. So it may well be, and, and again, I have clients where climate change has been perceived now as an opportunity. Uh, I have clients who are equipment suppliers and climate change and uh, is, is allowing them to bring out new ranges within their products. Uh, they will have a green range that they can hire out, which is, is much more energy efficient. So that's allowed them to actually identify a new opportunity. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the standard really does ask us though to maximise the opportunities and of course minimise the risks and uh, try and mitigate them wherever we can. If we do that properly, if we follow that process through and it's a logical flow from the context through interested parties through to identifying the risks and opportunities, 
this will ensure that we have a successful EMS that's going to benefit the organisation as a whole and will certainly help us achieve the expected outcome, which is improved environmental performance. And the final one of the, the areas that I say uh, I, I contend are the major changes is the life cycle perspective. Again, um, the old standard really had us looking to cross a one-way street, so we were only looking one way. Uh, and we were looking at really how we impact on the environment, and we were looking at what we do um, as I say, what we put up the chimney, what we put down the drain, etc., etc. The new standard asks us to consider a life cycle perspective. Now, for those of you that know about life, life cycle analysis, it's not asking us to carry out a full, detailed, documented life cycle perspective. What it's asking us to remember is that all, most of our environmental aspects will have upstream as well as downstream impacts. So we may have to look at the acquisition of raw materials. Where do the raw materials come from? How are they delivered to us? How sustainable is that supply chain? We have to look at design, the design of the products that we are selling, the design of the service we're offering. We look at production, transportation delivery. And particularly interesting now is use and end-of-life disposal. Again, there are starting to be legislative requirements on this. But we may have to look at the type of information we provide to end users of our product that will help them maybe in 10 years time properly dispose of our products that they bought from us. So it is very much a case of looking at uh, the environment and the life cycle perspective as a 360 degree circle if you like. Okay. So, what have we learned in the last 12 months? The most successful transitions have been undertaken by companies who've already had a fairly advanced, mature quality or environmental management system in place. So people who've been comfortable with running management systems uh, and the culture of a management system is built into the business already. Also, the people who made the most successful transition are the people who have been planning this transition for some time. Now, although the standard is 12 months old, prior to that, for both of the standards, there was the what was known as the FDIS, the Final Draft International Standard. That was also available. And a lot of the companies that have made the most successful transition started the planning for this process actually before the standard was even launched formally 12 months ago. However, if you haven't made the transition already, the standard has been available for 12 months. And certainly, I as an assessor have already started to have dialogue with my clients as I've been going through assessing them to the old standard, starting to ask questions and prompt them to start thinking about maybe how this clause would look under the new standard. So a continual dialogue with the assessor I think is, is vital. We also, within NQA, produce a gap analysis tool. The gap analysis tool, if you're an NQA client, is provided to you uh, prior to the assessment. Um, I believe it's also available to download from our website. So even if you're not an NQA client, you still we're still happy for you to take away that gap analysis tool. And a lot of people have been using that tool as a way of guiding their implementation of the new standards. Now, interestingly, although the new standards, both standards allow, if you want, for a radical change in the style of the documented system, it's entirely up to you with the new standards how you document that system. Most people have chosen more or less to stick with what they've already got, but amend that into a format required by the new standards. So I've yet to go to anybody, if I'm honest, where they've thrown everything out and started with a blank sheet of paper and said, we'll start again. Uh, so they've, they've, they've tended to go through their existing system, as I've suggested I did with, with, with a lot of my clients, speaking to them about each clause and trying to work out how this particular area of the standard of the system will actually look under the new standard. However, most importantly, 
I think, has been the buy-in and the demonstrable leadership at a senior level. If that's not in the, if that's not in place and is not demonstrable, it is very, very difficult to successfully transition. So the pitfalls are almost the the converse of that. Um, what we are looking at is people who struggled, and people who set out thinking actually, well, we only need to mind to do a minor tweak on the new to our existing system. So like underestimating the amount of change that was needed. Also, people who've not gone back to this context of the organization element of the standard, it's the first clause in the standard, the first auditable clause in the standard, and have not properly understood the context in which they're operating. Because if you get that bit wrong, everything that comes after there is also going to be wrong. People still thinking that the EMS is just about their own environmental impact and fairly to look at how the environment affects them. So still thinking they're crossing a one-way street rather than now realising they're crossing a two-way street and they need to take into account changing weather patterns, climate change, etc, etc. Top management not being involved. We pay you to do that. So in other words, I don't need to be involved. I, pay, I have an environmental manager. That's his job. Get on with it. That still happens, and I've seen that within the transition, that the senior top management are reluctantly being involved. Um, they're not always happy about speaking to the assessor, and when you're there, they make it clear that actually, I signed the policy, what more do you want me to do? We pay somebody else to do that. But I think the biggest issue, the biggest pitfall of all, is not allowing sufficient time. It will take longer than you think, both in terms of uh, the amount of hours during the week that it's going to take, and also the fact that you're not going to do this in three weeks. So, my suggestions, if you like, uh, in this area. So, a transition to the new standard is an excellent time to clean up the entire structure of your EMS or QMS and associated business practices. The standards require that we go back to basics, and I think it's a good idea to assume, although it may not be the case, but assume at the outset that everything else is going to have to change. And use this as an opportunity to go through your existing system and clean it up if you like. Use it as an opportunity for your system to evolve and align with global business practices. So in other words, is this a system that you're working with that was written 15 years ago? As I said right at the start of my little section, the environment has changed in the last 10 years and will certainly continue to change. Make sure that what you're talking about within the system, make sure that the things that you're undertaking are current, are are today's technology, not yesterday's technology. And it's an opportunity to revitalize environmental standards and indeed quality standards amongst the workforce. Chance to relaunch things. Work with contractors and suppliers because we do have to look upstream now. So our contractors and our suppliers are an important part of our environmental impact. And try and make compliance with environmental requirements a priority within their activities. You must certainly get top management involved, and I'm going to turn this around and it said, we pay them to do that. They are paid to get involved. So if they throw at you, we pay you to do that. Throw back at them, we pay you to actually lead. Start now. You must make sure that you allow sufficient time. So, finally from me, just for now, so to ensure a smooth transition, it's part of our NQA transition policy that you must complete a transition gap analysis checklist. It is available on our website. It's known as TR006, uh, Transition Form 6, and it's on our website and you can download it. Anybody can download it. There are two separate ones, one for quality and one for environment. Use of this gap analysis will ensure that the transition is carried out in a smooth way. 
It ensures that all the changes have been considered and addressed, that you haven't missed anything out. It needs to be available on the day of the transition audit and available to the assessor. And it does partly, if you fill out the whole of the document, will allow you to demonstrate that you've fulfilled the internal audit requirements of the new standard. And we are finding that a lot of our transition clients have benefited from using this in its, in its fullest way. So it is available as a download as a client gap analysis tool on, on our website. Margaret. Thank you, Richard. We come now to probably my favorite slide in this presentation. Um, we hope that, from all that's been said, we're not alarming you too much. The main thing is please don't panic. And I find myself saying this frequently to both clients and fellow assessors, don't panic. I ha heard a lovely um, expression uh, just earlier this week. Are the management system standards a tool or a task? If you approach the 2015 standards as a task, yes, you're going to panic, you're going to feel anxious. If you approach them as a tool, they're actually full of what makes sense for an effective business. So our top takeaways, if you like, we're all still learning. Assessors are learning too. It sounds like a horrible cliche, but we are all in this together. So don't panic. I think it's actually going to take several years for us all to see the full benefits of Annex SL, understanding context and risk, and to therefore enable the QMS to fully integrate with and support the business. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. As with your management systems even before now, they will have evolved and developed. Exactly the same is going to happen with your 20 15 standard. But very importantly, as Richard said, don't delay your implementation. You can start now. Start thinking about it now and engage with your assessor on what you might need to do. Now, I'd just like to finish off by saying a little bit, but not very much, on the ISO 45001 standard. As you're well aware already, it too is structured around the Annex SL, those 10 clauses. And you've probably seen this uh, timeline or something like it. Now, the latest information that we have is that final publication is not expected until probably December 2017. But we are expecting the second disc, that's the second draft, uh, either December this year or certainly early next year. And our advice is don't get too anxious about 45,001 just yet. Uh, wait and see what the second disc brings. Um, there's not a great deal that you can do at the moment until we see what the next draft brings and very importantly what the F disc brings. And as Richard said earlier, it's really at the F disc stage that you can seriously think about transitioning your health and safety system. So our advice in the meantime, if you are starting from scratch, well, press on with the existing standard, the OSAS 18001, and use it as a stepping stone. As with uh, the environment, you identify your sources of legal compliance information, you review your hazards and risks, and um, you can think about a gap analysis. That would be for within your own system, what do you not do now that you will need to do to meet the OSAS requirements and, in the fullness of time, the 45,001 requirements. So when you wish to migrate from OSAS 18,001, we suggest you wait until we have the FDIS of 45,001 and then you can start to uh, look more closely at that and determine what it is you need to do. So read the FDIS carefully when it's available. 
carry out a gap analysis. And as with 9 and 14, we will be developing a gap analysis tool to help you do that. And start your mapping exercise, start moving forward to uh, move your system from OSAS to uh, 45,001. Those of you that have already been through this process or are going through it for the 9,001 and 14,001, you will understand what all of um, that means. Very importantly, do be prepared, but don't forget, we can't actually certify you until the standard itself is published. And as I say, we're not expecting that until 2017. But you can be thinking about it and, again, engage in dialogue with your assessor, uh, particularly at the FDIS stage. Thank you very much for listening. And we have time now for some questions that have been submitted during our presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Margaret and Richard. And we'll start to go through some of your questions. So the first question that has come in is, if a company was starting the conversion straight away, what resources would you recommend for them to look at? I obviously make sure you've got a copy of the standard would be a good place to start. Uh, that's probably taken as read. Um, however, um, I think we would certainly need you to have a look at your existing system and try and to see where the gaps may occur between your old standard, the old system and the new system. So try and carry out this gap analysis. Use our gap analysis tool or, or uh, a similar one that may be out there, but use a gap analysis tool to, to look at where you are between your existing system and the new system, but particularly make sure that you understand this, this context of the organization to make sure that you, both from a quality or environmental perspective, and you haven't made it clear which in the question as to which, which standard, but it applies equally to both standards, to make sure that you understand who you are, why you're doing what you're doing, who and what is important to you, and what are the external influences that you can uh, or have to take into account. Is there anything you would add to that, Margaret? Um, I think the main thing would be um, time. Give yourself plenty of time to think and to think long and hard about your context and also about your risks, to, to think about it. And talk to your colleagues, talk to your managers, talk to your assessor about these issues. Okay. What is the biggest problem that you are seeing organizations running to when trying to transition to 9001? And to 14,001 from your personal assessor experience. Margaret, you go first. Um, I think the biggest problem is maybe people getting a little anxious about it before they have fully looked into what the changes are and what they need to do. Um, our gap analysis tool, we've worked hard at improving that and simplifying that because, again, people have occasionally felt a little bit panicked uh, when they look at the gap analysis and uh, what, what is required. Um, I think people feel they need to um, throw out everything that they've got and start again. As Richard said, it's an opportunity to have a good clear out review what you've got, um, but your documentation structure, for, for example, if it already works for you, why would you change it? You simply need to make sure it works for you in the context of uh, the 2015. But again, I think just take time to study the differences and to understand um, what, what they are. Okay. Yeah. Same for 14,001 as well? Yes, I think it's the same for 14,001. I think this, that particular area applies to both standards. Uh, but again, you need to make sure 
the biggest issue I find is not understanding the context and also not getting the necessary buy-in from top management. Top management too, for so long have said, we employ somebody to do that, get on and do it. They need to be made to, to be aware that they have a key role to play within this and will have to demonstrate that to an auditor. Remember the earlier slides I showed, it's not just about talking to them, we will make that judgment based on a number of areas including how the system is integrated into the overall business practice. Do the objectives that are set fit with the normal business objectives? So there's a lot of areas that we can use to judge the success of uh, top management commitment. Okay, and with regards to quality manuals, being a terminology, it, are formal procedures and quality manuals still required? 9001 does not now require a quality manual. The 2008 version, it was a requirement that there was a quality management in place. <clears throat> the new standards, both 9 and 14, have dropped the terminologies, manuals, procedures, forms, records. Everything is now called documented information. And it is for you to set the level of documentation that you feel is appropriate to be able to demonstrate that you are in control of your processes. So if you feel that you still need a quality manual and you've been used to having a quality manual and likewise the same for an environmental manual, and this is one of the things I was alluding to earlier when I was talking about people not throwing everything out and starting again, a lot of the clients I've transitioned on 14,001 have maintained their environmental manual. That's the culture that they've come from, that's the way that they've been used to working and they've used it as a very successful tool, as a map, as a roadmap if you like, as to how the system is structured. The choice now is entirely up to you. There is nobody now can say, I've only got this bit of paper because the standard says I have to have it. The standard doesn't say that at all anymore. There are some areas where it does say documented information needs to be maintained, and that's usually to demonstrate compliance with something. But in terms of a manual, if you want a manual, you can have one. If you don't want a manual, you don't have to have one. Thank you very much. In 9001-2008, we have exemptions of design and development. Is this still valid under the 2015 standard? It's still valid in that if you don't do design, then you don't need to have anything relating to that in your management system. I don't believe there's a requirement to explicitly exclude it. Um, if you don't do it, it's, it's not relevant. You would need to let your assessment body know because one of the ways that we work out the number of assessment days, <clears throat> if a design clause is being utilised within a system, this is obviously 9001 now, there may be additional auditing time required. But in terms of the standard, in terms of your system itself, you no longer have to have a set of um, exemptions and justified exemptions. If you don't do something, it's just not included within the system. The new standards and Annex SL enables integration of a management system. What are the limitations organisations still have with holding from implementing an IMS? Or why should they implement an IMS? Interesting question. Um, we would always recommend, as a certification body, we would recommend integration because particularly now, the whole, the whole idea of this new suite of standards uh, and 9 and 14 are the two that have been issued to date obviously we've, as we've heard 45,001 is coming next and there will be others I'm sure that 50,001 will be being transitioned at some point as well the idea is that they are they've been rewritten in a format where integration is, is much easier um, so if you were to, this is how I've always described a, a, an environmental management or an integrated management system, um, you would have a, a core management structure. I used to describe this as a Christmas tree. 
So you've got a, a core management structure that was common to all. That was the tree itself. And then you hang on different decorations, different baubles, dependent upon whether they're quality, environment, health and safety, food safety and energy, whatever it may be. So the, the same structure applies to all. Now, you could, if you chose to, have three separate systems. You, you could have a standalone quality system, a standalone environmental system, a standalone health and safety system. You would be replicating a huge amount of documentation. You would have a non-conformance form for energy, a non-conformance form for quality, a non-conformance form for health and safety, and so on. I'm not sure why you would choose to do that. It may be uh, that the sector that you are in may require you to keep things apart. It may be that you have to uh, answer non-conformances in a slightly different way, so therefore the quality non-conformance form may have to be slightly different to an environmental non-conformance form. I've yet to come across a company that I can't convince that an integrated management system is much more appropriate in the long term. It's got to be the answer. Uh, the standards have been designed in the way they have to aid that because prior to both of these new standards coming out, the closed numbers were all over the place. They didn't align up and um, one of the big benefits to me has been the standards now follow this Annex SL process and it was all about helping with integration. So linked to that is another question um, which comes in that says if you've got more procedures currently than the standard requires, what is the best way to morph that existing management system to fit the new standard? Well, interestingly, uh, the new standard doesn't require you to have any procedures. So you could argue you've got 45 more procedures than the standard requires. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, it's entirely up to you to decide what level of procedures you need to maintain control over your processes. Now, I don't know what type of business the questioner is in, uh, so 45 procedures is quite a lot. Uh, don't often see that many uh, numbers of procedures these days. But what you need to think about is, is go back to the processes that those procedures manage and look at it is a procedure the best way to manage that process? The two opposite extremes in managing processes are either by a fully documented procedure or you manage a process by the competence of the people carrying out the work. If you are employing, for argument's sake, fully competent welders, you would not need a procedure to tell them how to operate a welding machine. So therefore, that would be a procedure that you could dispense with. Now, where you actually use competence as a way of managing a process, you have to then demonstrate that you have thought about the competency levels required, and that is an area that both standards require that you document, that you document the required competency levels. What I would do is go back through those 45 procedures, look to see what it is they are controlling, and do you still need a procedure to effectively control that process? Or can you control it by the competency of the people carrying out the work? Okay, thank you. With regards to interested parties, where do we draw the line? Do we have to actually ask them their requirements and expectations? Well, the interested parties, you will identify for yourself. And if you recall, I said earlier, it's probably going to take a number of years for us all to really get to grips with these new standards and to really get the full benefits. You will be thinking now about your interested parties. As with everything else in your management system, you will review who you believe your interested parties are. So where do you draw the line? Wherever you feel is sensible at this point in time, you may draw a line today, you may come back in a month or two and think, actually, there's another group of people we really need to consider, uh, and we haven't. Um, how much you already know about their needs and expectations, um, you will already be aware of a lot of that. There may be some where, as you begin to structure your thinking and think about your interested parties, yes, it would be quite valid to go to them and um, probe them a little bit more than perhaps you have before about what their expectations are. 
But in this question, you're already doing what these new standards expect of us, which is to start thinking about these things. We're not going to come up with all of the answers straight away, but at least we're starting to think in a slightly different way about what our management system is for. Okay. Risk is a new term in the 2015 standard. Um, where should organisations begin or end when thinking about documenting and demonstrating their risk and their understanding of risk? I'll start with uh, an environmental perspective because I think in terms of risk and aspects we possibly think of risk being more pertinent to the environment. There is a risk in quality, obviously. Um, but when we think of risk, we traditionally think of health and safety type risks, environmental type risks. Um, for most people transitioning, the, the risk process is going to start with two areas. You'll start with your existing aspects and impact evaluation. You should have that in place already, which will tell you uh, what you are doing that has the biggest impact, the biggest risk on the environment. You also need to start to think about, as we said right at the start now, this, this context of the organization. This is where we work out what our risks are. And risks can risks are usually related to not complying with something, not meeting somebody's requirements, whether they are a customer risk, so that would apply to quality. Obviously, failure to supply parts as required by the customer is going to be quite a big risk and ultimately could lose you the contract. Failure to meet a piece of environmental legislation could possibly see your senior management in court possibly being prosecuted for a potential or actual breach of, 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 of environmental legislation. But risk can also be risk in terms of letting people down, failure to meet people's expectations of what you may be um, capable of doing. <clears throat> so in terms of documenting the risk, the standards now require that we take this risk uh, process. And it is a little bit more than just from an environmental perspective. It's a little bit more than just saying we have an existing aspects and impacts evaluation. We need to consider, as I said before this afternoon, we need to consider the risks that are thrown at us from the environment. It was, somebody said to me the other day, we've been throwing things at the environment for such a long time, the environment's fighting back. And, and we see that more and more uh, happening, and you need to be able to be aware of that and plan accordingly. So risk management is about looking for these areas where, we, where things are being, in inverted commas, thrown at us, and working out how we can mitigate that. But also, just as importantly, within our risk management processes, that we also identify the opportunities, because where there's a risk, there is usually an associated opportunity that will allow us to, to make that, that improvement. But please, if you look coming at this from a 14,001 perspective, don't think it's as sufficient as just saying, here's my existing aspects and impacts evaluation. Thank you, Richard. Um, how do you determine uh, the environmental aspects in a service organisation? Everybody who um, does anything these days will have environmental aspects. Um, I'll ask a question and answer it myself. Those people who sat through one of my previous webinars will have heard me ask this question. When Einstein was asked what he considered was the environment, he said it was everything that wasn't me. So no matter who we are, no matter whether we are a one-person service company, a one-man one band consultancy sat in a little office somewhere, or whether we are the world's biggest chemical company, we all do things that have impacts on people outside of uh, our organisation. So as a, as, a, uh, as a consultancy type company, one of the interesting areas that, that gets forgotten about is, is the impact of your influence on the behaviour of other people. 
And please remember to capture that as an opportunity. Because to me as a consultant, and I used to work as a consultant before I became an assessor, one of the things that I was most proud of was my ability to change people's behaviour. And that is an opportunity for you as a consultant. Yes, you have negative impacts on the environment. You're using electricity, you're driving around. Uh, hopefully you're not driving around in a big uh, fuel-hungry car, things like that. But at the end of the day, to me, the biggest area that you need to make sure that you've captured is the positive impact that you're having on your clients. Okay. Um, I'm conscious we're just over time now, so I'll just ask you both one final question to each of you. Um, and I'm sure this is a very hot topic at the moment, but with regards to each of the standards, what are some of the typical trends that you've found where people have struggled with certain new clauses? Is it with identifying the context? Is it with leadership? What are the kind of trends that each of you have seen? I'll, I'll start that. I think um, context and understanding exactly what that is and how to arrive at an understanding of that um, has challenged many, uh, many people. Not all, but some organizations are challenged by this. And um, our article in In Touch some months ago was partly in a response to try and, and help people um, through that. The other challenge, certainly from a 9001 point of view, I know Richard spoke a few minutes ago about risk, um, an understanding of risk-based thinking. And the message I try and get across is if you can cast your mind back to that uh, matrix of the clause standards. We in quality management have actually been working with risk for a very long time. We haven't called it that. We define our procedures in a certain way. Why are they in that way? It's actually to prevent things going wrong, but we haven't necessarily thought of it in that way. So I think um, what, what really is risk, and it was behind a, an earlier question, I think, about you know, listing of, of the risks, um, it's that understanding of risk um, and how to how to approach it. So it's, it's it's early days, but I think we're all gradually making some progress with that. And I think likewise, um, the context of the organisation and particularly questions about how to document that that process has been carried out satisfactorily. It's not an area that does need to be formally documented. I think the documenting of that comes later on in terms of how you build that into your risk analysis. But for me, I think some of the bigger areas that, that, that I've found people having issues with is particularly with regard to this sort of 360 degree thinking in terms of the environment. And, and making the transition, the big jump from this being about um, how we impact on the environment to looking at how the environment impacts upon us and also looking at the fact that we have upstream environmental impacts rather than just downstream and one of the questions I get asked the most is if I'm buying a raw material how far back up that supply chain do I have to go? Do I have to go right the way back to somebody in sub-Saharan Africa digging the ore out of the ground? And of course no you don't but what I say to everybody, this is a journey, not a destination, and to start to do things like this in manageable chunks. So to start to look at maybe the first level, going back up at your supply chain, and then maybe continual improvement, which is a requirement of both standards, continual improvement in the system itself, to then start to go a little bit further back in the supply chain, and, and that will allow you to, to have a better evaluation of where things are coming from, but will also, if you like, tick the box that this also gives us some area of, of continual improvement in that area. But I think, yeah, the, the, the big area is this understanding, getting our minds around the fact that it's suddenly the environment has become a two-way street. It's not a one-way street anymore. Okay, thank you very much. So that is the end of the webinar and the Q&A section. We have received a huge amount of questions uh, that unfortunately we've not been able to get through today on this one webinar, but 
We will answer each of them individually and forward of um, FAQs um, after, well, give us a week or so <laughs> to answer them all, and we will come back to you with those if we haven't managed to answer it today on the webinar. A huge thank you to both Margaret and Richard for their presentations, and also to Edie for hosting this webinar. And thank you very much for joining us to mark this anniversary of the 9001 and 14001 standards. We wish you well in your future transitions and your integrated management certifications as well. Thank you.